morning and a very warm welcome to our service today. As usual, I'm pleased to welcome all our friends from both Craigie Simonton and Presbyterian South Parish Churches, and of course to any friends or visitors who may have joined us today. Wherever you're watching or listening to this service, it's really wonderful to have you worshipping with us, and I hope that you enjoy our worship together. As the psalmist said, Give thanks to the Lord because he is good and his love is eternal. Let the people of Israel say, his love is eternal. Listen to the glad shouts of victory in the tents of God's people. The Lord's mighty power has done it. His power has brought us victory. I will not die. Instead, I will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. Let us come together and let us worship God in our first hymn, Christ is Alive. first reading today is from Psalm 126 and in this passage we hear how the children of Israel celebrate the release from captivity by laughing and singing praises to God for all that he has done for them and as usual our reading is brought to us by Anne. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we were filled with joy. Restore our fortunes. Lord, like the streams in Negev, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. I wonder what makes you laugh. The psalm Anne just read to us tells us that the children of Israel were filled with laughter and songs because of what God had done for them. 
It's one of a number of psalms written about the joy, the laughter and song that's dedicated to God because of the actions he's taken on our behalf. So I ask you again, what makes you laugh? Perhaps it's the antics of your pets. After all, they can be quite funny, especially the ones that I've seen when you've been framed. Or perhaps it's a particular comedy show that, that you like. Mine's or some mothers do have them, and the Morecambe and Wise show. I know I'm showing my age, but I still laugh heartily whenever I see them. Or perhaps it's a particular comedian that makes you laugh. Someone like Tommy Cooper or Tim Vine. Now it's okay, I'm not going to tell any jokes. Well, except for the one about the Scotsman, the Irishman. No, really, I'm not going to tell any jokes. Perhaps it's the antics of your family and friends that make you laugh. Or the stories that you share with them. Whatever it is that makes you laugh, then to me, that's a good thing. I think it's important that we all have a good laugh every now and then. As my father would say, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Well, I want to share with you today one of the things that makes me laugh, and that's my grandchildren. Not by what they say, although sometimes they can be very funny when they don't really mean to be. No, it's about more the way they are and the way they behave, particularly together. When we go with them to Dumfries House, one of the activities they love doing is going to the park and playing on the swings. They lie face down, facing each other, and as the swing is pushed higher and higher, they start to play off one another's excitement. One of them will start to laugh as the thrill of the ride intensifies and soon they all join in until their laughter is so intense that it's impossible for me not to join in in their laughter. Children's lives should be full of laughter. But sadly, that's not always the case. When I started training for ministry, I got involved with the local boys' brigade company. One summer, the captain, Ian, organised a trip to Romania as a guest of the Rima Foundation, an organisation which was set up in the wake of the Chescu regime. It was set up to help some of the abandoned children who suffered from HIV a disease which they all got from infected blood transfusions. And when the group returned from that visit, they gave us a presentation in church on their experiences. And Ian, the captain, recalled that the children were kept in soulless wards, tied to their cots with no human comfort or love. And when they first met the children, he said their expressionless faces were an indication of the lives that had been taken away from them. He told us that those children were not orphans. They had been abandoned by their parents because they all had HIV and they would have been a financial burden on their family. The senior boys told us about one boy in particular that they met whose parents had been found and who decided to take him back. But apparently only because the government had decided to pay an allowance for those who looked after children with HIV. They treated him in a horrific manner. And a week before the boys arrived in Romania, the boy returned to the foundation, telling them that he had no reason to live. It's unimaginable 
how you would feel having been abandoned as an infant and then being abandoned as a youth. The senior boys also recalled that when they played games with the children, at first the children were reluctant to join in. But very soon they began to take part. They began to smile and participate in the games. And it didn't take long before the sound of laughter filled the normally sad and quiet countryside. That presentation from Ian and the boys brought home to me the reality of children devastated by humankind's brutality. But laughter had brought them all together and on that particular day and for the remaining days of the visit, the children were children again and the sound of laughter could be heard on a regular basis. In Psalm 126, we read of the unbridled joy of the children of Israel when they remembered how God had delivered them from captivity. They laughed and sang with sheer delight to God who had done great things for them. They had endured captivity, sadness, maltreatment, but in the end, their joy was unfettered. There are many people around the world today, like those children in Romania, who are in similar situations, having endured severe hardship, who are suddenly full of joy when they receive a little kindness and love, and their lives are changed for the better. At this time, we have all endured some difficulty in our lives, including the loss of our freedoms, not being able to see our loved ones, not being able to live normally, not being able to meet up with family and friends, and of course, the loss of loved ones. COVID-19 has had a devastating effect on our lives. But we can't lose sight of the fact that God has done and is still doing great things for us. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, God has freed us yet again from captivity. And what should be our response be? Well, it should be one of celebration involving joyous laughter at all the great things that God has done and is still doing. We need never to forget that God is always there for us. Amen. And now in the quietness of this sanctuary, let us come together in prayer. Let us pray. Living God, you are more powerful, more passionate, more generous, more just, than we can ever imagine. We come to you this morning from many different backgrounds and situations, but wherever we have come from, we come to worship in this joyous season of the year. Lord, some of us have come in faith, some in fear, some in joyful certainty, and some with minds full of questions. However, you are big enough to cope, so as long as we are honest before you and our prayers are real, you see the bigger picture as we do not, and you're strong enough to hold us no matter what. Father, there are days when faith comes easily, when all is light and sunshine and hope. And you are glad to hear our songs of joyful celebration. Even you know, you know, as we do not, that the time may well come when our voices crack and our hearts can no longer sing. And in those days of darkness and doubt, when the solid ground of faith has crumbled beneath our feet and hope has almost gone, you are every bit as glad to hear our questions and our accusations, 
even though you know, as we do not, that the time will come when the clouds will lift and our hearts can sing again. God of Good Friday and Easter morning, and of all the dark Saturdays in between, we give thanks that there is no part of us you do not know, understand and love. There is no path we have to take that you have not already travelled. Nowhere we can go that you will not be with us. And so we come to worship this morning with the signs of springtime slowly appearing in the world around us. And so with a dawning sense of hope and gladness inside us, we bring our thanks and praise as generations before us have. Lord God, draw near to us, we pray. In the words we say, in the songs we sing, in the quiet places of our hearts, in our meeting with each other, so that when we leave this place, we will be able to say, each in our own way and our own time, that we have seen the Lord. All these prayers we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us follow along with the words and music of our second hymn, The Church is Wherever God's People Are Praising. Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, reading from chapter 20, reading from verses 19 to 31. And in this passage we hear of Jesus appearing to his disciples gathered in the upper room. But one of them, Thomas, is missing. And when he returns, he doubts the account of the other disciples. Then a week later, Jesus appears again. And this time Thomas is there and proclaims Jesus, his Lord and his God. And as usual, this reading will be brought to us by Tosh. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. 
Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thank you, Tosh, for that reading. In our Gospel reading today, we read about the disciple Thomas. I believe he must be one of the most misunderstood people in the Bible. And I don't just say that because him and I share the same first name. No, Thomas is often called Doubting Thomas, with the distinct implication that this is some sort of fault. And today's passage is often used to reinforce that belief. But that is something I want to challenge today. I believe if we take a closer look at the story of Thomas, then we will find that he is not a doubter, but a man of faith and a man of very strong belief. We learn very little of Thomas in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. And it's only in John's Gospel that we learn a lot more about Thomas and his faith. The first mention of Thomas in the Gospel of John is in chapter 11, where we hear that Jesus has heard about the death of Lazarus. And he wants to go back to Judea to be with his friends and Lazarus' family. The other disciples remind him that the Judeans had tried to stone him and they are worried and afraid that they might kill him if he goes back. And so they try to persuade Jesus not to go. And they point out that the Jewish leaders at that time were looking for a reason to kill him. It is Thomas who realises that Jesus' mind is made up and he's going to his friends. It is then that Thomas says to him, let us also go, that may we die with him. Doesn't sound much like he doubted Jesus at all. In fact, it sounds rather like calling him doubting Thomas. We should be calling him fearless Thomas or loyal Thomas, or even loving Thomas. Because Thomas was willing to stand by Jesus, even if that meant death. A few chapters later in John's Gospel, he records the prayer of Jesus at the Last Supper. Jesus is preparing the disciples for what is about to happen. For his Passover through suffering to glory, but not in a very straightforward way. Instead, he's explaining it in a very veiled way. Or as we would say today, he was talking in riddles. Now, like me, 
Thomas wasn't the quickest when it came to working out riddles or what Jesus meant when he spoke in parables. So I can imagine that at that point, Thomas was confused and he was trying very hard to work out what Jesus was saying and what it meant. And I'm sure he wasn't alone. The other disciples would just have been as perplexed and wondering what Jesus meant. But perhaps they were afraid to show their ignorance or perhaps draw attention to themselves. After all, a few minutes earlier, Peter had protested that he would be faithful to Jesus even unto death. And Jesus cut him down to size by telling him he'd deny him three times before the cock crowed. So who in that situation would dare speak up? Well, it was Thomas. He wasn't cowed into silence. He didn't understand, but he wanted to. And so in exasperation he says, We don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? That's right. Say it as it is, Thomas. He didn't understand, and so he can't follow Jesus unless he knows where and how. It's as simple as that. So perhaps we should call him straightforward Thomas, or even simple Thomas, or how about refreshingly direct and realistic Thomas? Anything but doubting. Both of these stories bring today's reading into context. The risen Christ arrives when Thomas is out. The disciples are locked away in the upper room, hiding from the world, afraid of what might happen if they venture out. And it is to this situation, according to our scripture reading, that Jesus appears and fills them with joy. He gives them a mission and empowers them to go out and spread the word, to share the spirit and to continue his saving work. However, Thomas isn't there. He'd stepped out briefly Maybe to pop out to the shops for some supplies, or perhaps to find out the latest news and gossip. Whatever the reason, he, unlike the rest, ventured forth. You could say he was either fearless or foolhardy, or maybe even both. Yet he had ventured out. Then when he returns, the other disciples tell him that Jesus has appeared. The risen Lord had been among them. But for Thomas, something doesn't ring true. If they had seen the Lord and he's filled them with the Holy Spirit, why are they still locked up in a room? If they're filled with joy, why can't he read that in their faces? And why aren't they sharing that joy with others? If they've been empowered by the Spirit to continue Jesus' work, what are they waiting for? Are they waiting for Thomas to return? Surely not. Or if they were, they would have been breathless and eager that he'd have seen it in their eyes. So in his own way, Thomas says to them, I don't believe you. Thomas, simple, loyal, loving, straightforward, down to earth, direct, who didn't understand but wanted to, who longed to follow Jesus but who needed to know the way. Thomas didn't doubt Jesus. He simply doubted his friends. He found it highly unlikely 
that the risen Lord had appeared because he was surrounded by a group of witnesses whom he simply didn't find credible. Thank goodness for Thomas because he reminds us that we need to be credible witnesses for Christ. There's an ancient saying in the Eastern Church that if you want to know if Jesus is risen, look at the faces of the people at Easter. Thomas couldn't see the presence of the risen Christ in his friends' faces, and so he found it difficult to believe them. Also, when Thomas had missed Jesus' return the first time in the upper room, he must have been very upset and disappointed. The one who said, I'll die with you, missed the one he'd die for. But although we can understand Thomas being hurt and saying the words he said, we also need to remember that they are words that many of us in that same situation would probably have used as well. Thomas was not only hurting at missing Jesus, he was also afraid. He was afraid that everything around him was changing. The world they found themselves in was not easy. They had gone from a world where everything felt right and secure, and now everything was changing. The things they always thought secure had shifted. Doesn't that sound familiar? Thomas's reaction was a natural reaction to a fear that everything he had become familiar with through Jesus, the healing, the renewal, the new enthusiasm for God, everything he felt good about in faith had just been destroyed. Thomas's reaction was the fear that the hope Jesus had given them had been crushed. He was afraid he'd lost everything. His relationship with Jesus, with his friends, and with God had all gone as a result of the crucifixion. And so, imagine his delight when Jesus appears again and despite what he said about touching the wounds, Thomas refrains from doing so. He doesn't need to, but instead he falls to his knees and calls, My Lord and my God. Simply seeing Jesus meant he had discovered his relationship with Jesus was still as strong after the crucifixion as it had been before. This story of Thomas spoke into John's faith community and as it speaks into them about restoration of their relationship with Jesus, so it does for us too. As we try to find our way through this unfamiliar world, we find ourselves in a world that has been forever reshaped by the COVID-19 pandemic. Perhaps we can look to Thomas and rebrand him as a non-doubter because surely we find in him the truth that the resurrection is a relationship restored. No, it's more than that. Resurrection is a relationship restored with Christ, with each other, and of course with God. Thomas's story tells us in these times of tombs, of darkness, of COVID-19, nothing can break our relationship with each other, with Jesus, with God. Not now and not in the future. That's what the experience of Thomas tells us. Even when you experience something anyone would imagine would break the future forever. The promise of resurrection 
invites us into a future faithfully armed with hope, a possibility of renewal of life. And the same way as Thomas's story encouraged followers of the past, it is a gift to the church now. However that church will be in the future, we must remember that although everything is changing and the old familiar is gone, the new is possible. Thomas is encouraging us right now with the truth that he discovered. Resurrection is a relationship, a relationship with the future, a relationship with each other, a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with God, that nothing now or in the future can ever break. Amen. In the quietness of this sanctuary, let us come together now in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for Thomas and his incredible trust that the impossible might be true. Thank you that he was willing to be proved wrong. Thank you for whatever it was that convinced him and helped us to be on, as honest and as open-minded as he was, so that our faith, when it settles, will be real, and our stories will be an encouragement to others, as his has been to us today. Lord God, you appeared to the disciples and you said, Peace be with you. But Lord, there are so many places in our world today where peace is sadly lacking. Places where war and violence rage on as a result of humankind's desire for power and possessions. Lord, we pray for all those countries where violence is commonplace. We pray that peace can be restored to those areas and people can live together in harmony, respecting their differences. Risen Lord, we pray for all those people affected by the lockdowns as a result of the pandemic. For those who are struggling with their feelings of guilt as they are unable to be with loved ones and who cannot offer a word or a hug in times of distress or illness or loss. For those who feel the pain of bereavement but are unable to share it with other family members and friends. For those in their under-resourced hospitals and care homes who are working tirelessly to provide the care and attention needed by their charges. Lord, breathe on them your peace and may it bring some respite, some comfort and peace to their hearts. Risen God, we pray for all ministers, elders, office bearers, volunteers and members of your church, that they may be strengthened and encouraged by your Holy Spirit. We pray that your church will be a place of expanding walls and generous hospitality, where all are truly welcome. With their faith, with their doubts, with their anger, with their sadness and a joy that is all the more real for knowing you. Gracious God, we're called to do our living and believing in times very different from those first heady days after Easter. Blessed are those, Jesus said, who believe without seeing. Grant us that blessing, we pray. And may our honest, ever-changing, ever-deepening faith be a blessing to others. Lord Jesus Christ, as we have travelled with you throughout Holy Week and witnessed your suffering, dying and rising, may we have learned humility, 
sacrifice, forgiveness and compassion to an extent that we are now better prepared to go forth and be witnesses for you in today's world. All this we pray in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Christ Has Risen. Now I'd like to thank you for joining me this morning from wherever you are in the world. And once again can I express my very sincere thanks to Arthur, Anne and Tosh for their invaluable help in pulling this service together. It is as always very much appreciated. Finally, can I just remind people to share with others how to access our services either via the YouTube channel or via the telephone. And whilst the current restrictions continue, I pray that you all stay safe and take care. And now let us close with the blessing. With our doubts alleviated, our fears subsided, and our hopes revived, let us go in peace to love and to serve the risen Lord. And may the grace of the risen Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, those whom you love, and those you struggle to love, today and always. Amen.